So this, I don't know if anyone remembers, this is something I mentioned a couple of years ago um, when when MicroStrategy started getting infamous in 2021 because Michael Saylor started buying up Bitcoin galore and I watched this interview uh, and I can't find that interview now but he basically said I'm never going to stop buying Bitcoin and I'm never going to sell Bitcoin. This is, you know, the most energy dense asset on the planet, yada, 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 and all the, the typical Michael Saylor analogies, which are, by the way, amazing. Um, so if you're ever bored, just watch Michael Saylor videos. Um, and, and he kept talking about how, you know, buying buying um, micro strategies is like buying bitcoin with a bit of leverage etc etc and then i thought that's interesting because at this rate the way he's going micro strategies could end up potentially being one of the most valuable companies on the planet and i talked about this feedback loop and guess what this feedback loop seems to be have um be picked up um quite a bit so let me explain what i mean so let's just do this. Let's make this smaller. So make it much smaller. So there's the first bit and then there's a critical mass. So um, with any feedback loop or positive flywheel, etc., you have to do a certain critical mass threshold of work and activity and then things start flowing. So imagine um, pumping up water from a well. You can pump, 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 but if you stop at any point, the water goes right back to the beginning, uh, bottom, and you have to start all over again. But once you pump it to a point where the water's coming out, then you, you know, it's like a self-fulfilling thing, a bit like siphoning petrol out of, out of a car. Um, and so I guess there's, there's a, there's, let's, let's talk about where he started. So um, he uses micro strategies, MSTR, to borrow money. Oh, let's do it like this. Here we go. Cheap, cheaply slash free to buy Bitcoin. Um, rinse and repeat. Rinse and repeat and wait. Okay. So he's basic. I think he borrowed something like five billion dollars for an average of half a percent APR, which is <laughs> absolutely ridiculous. Um, with like 1.04 leverage. So, you know, he's, he's not using leverage at all. Um, accumulate ridiculous amounts of Bitcoin and ride volatility, right? So this is like the, the prerequisite sort of pumping until all is good. But this is where the sexy stuff comes in. Um, so if we then do this. So Bitcoin goes up. What happens? MSCR worth more. MSCR can then buy, can either uh, create more shares to sell, um, borrow more money because it's now a bigger company, better balance sheet, all that sort of stuff. Um, equals buy more BTC. Then rinse and repeat. And there's another sort of critical mass threshold here because at some point, MSTR gets so big, it joins the big boys club. Now, what is the big boys club? It's the S&P 500. It's, the, it's literally the mothership, as I've said for years, the, the S&P 500 is the biggest stock market on the planet um, and that's where basically all of the world's funds invest into. Um, and so the S&P 500, for those that are relatively new to RT, are the 500 biggest, most actively traded, uh, biggest market cap companies in the U US. And what happens is there are funds, pension funds, sovereign uh, monetary funds, family offices, fund of funds. There's like endless amounts of funds. Any th fund you can think of, they will all allocate uh, a chunk, whether it's small or big chunk, 
into trackers, right? I.e. the S&P 500. Every tracker fund you've ever heard of, you know, it, they will be tracking, you know, whether it's a FTSE tracker or whatever. But a lot of them, especially the big funds and trackers, are all S&P 500 related. So what this means is that with all these trackers, every single company within the S&P 500 will get an allocation of money. So if BlackRock has a tracker fund for, you know, an S&P 500 tracker fund, all 500 companies will get investment from that fund. And don't forget, there are tens of thousands. Now, there, now the, the, the bar raises, so I don't actually know how much, what, what market cap you need to be um, in order to get to position 500, but I don't know, it's probably 10, 20 billion dollars, something like that. But guess what? And I don't even know, I don't think he's there yet, but it'll be pretty damn soon because here's what happens. This is the masterclass. Bitcoin goes up again, worth more, and finally enters the S&P 500. Funds all over the globe are then forced to get <laughs> Bitcoin exposure, whether they like it or not. Because if you know if you've got an allocation in in micro strategies, it means you've got Bitcoin, and so funds all over the world will, by definition, have um, Bitcoin exposure. So. BTC goes up more, MSTR worth more, um, ah, sorry, equal more investment equals more buy more Bitcoin. MSTR rises up S and P 500 even faster equals more money. Rinse and repeat. So let's say we're correct. Let's say the Bitcoin power law is correct. And you know, in this cycle, it goes up to 200, 250K. I mean, that's going to absolutely propel micro strategies up the S and P five hundred ladder leaderboard, and if the power law is true and Bitcoin gets to a million dollars by the end of twenty thirty three, I mean, <laughs> micro strategy is going to get it's going to be insane. So the whole world is going to get Bitcoin exposure, whether they like it or not. This is the ultimate finance finance hack. I mean. The world is going to see an absolute avalanche and tsunami of Bitcoin, whether they like it or not. Isn't this beautiful, folks? Like, I've never been so bullish. And all the IFAs and all the people that hate crypto, like, they have no clue what's about to slap them in the face. <laughs> it's it's going to be amazing. I've, like, never been so bullish on crypto ever. But don't mistake that with volatility. Yes, there will be volatility, but again, uh, I, I am a big subscriber of the power law. I, I, I genuinely think that is, that's the real deal. So I think this is gonna be an interesting. Um, now talking about ETFs, uh, oh yeah, don't forget, ETFs are also um, causing a very big supply squeeze. So if we just um, get a new page, um, actually, let's do that. ETF. So the micro strategy thing that where it could go wrong to get into the S and P, they need four consecutive profitable quarters. So if they're, if they're that exposed to Bitcoin, yeah, that could. Well, true, but let's say Bitcoin just continues trucking up, you know, 50, 60, 70, yeah, I, think, 80. I think now, yeah, I think now we're in that situation. Yeah, I reckon this year they'll hit the S&P 500 for sure. Oh, sorry, maybe not this year, but if it needs four cons um, consecutive quarters, then make probably 2025. But it's Bitcoin's just going to keep on doing its thing. Um, and 
the the supply squeeze hasn't really been too much of an issue of Bitcoin up until now because there's just not enough retail buying. But now the ETFs are buying some, something to the tune of two and a half billion dollars per week. Um, th there's going to be a big supply squeeze. So if we take two and a half billion dollars, um, one, two, three, that's 20 foot, no, two, 500, no, way too many here. 250 billion, 25 billion, two and a half billion. Divide that by the price, I don't know, let's call it 60k Bitcoin. You're looking at 41, call it 40, yeah, 41,000 Bitcoin per week. So, Bitcoin, way. Now, I don't know how long the ETFs are going to keep on accumulating Bitcoin at that that rate or that pace but when you look at the the issuance there's only what um 900 bitcoin a day is that right i'm just trying to work this out um 900 bitcoin a week a day times seven you know there's only 6300 a week being released and now in april when we have the halving well guess what this halves so, and if, if even for a couple of months they maintain at, you know, some, you know, or let, let's say two and a half billion worth, either way, there's going to be way more demand than there is supply. So I, I, I think Bitcoin is, is in for one hell of a supply squeeze, um, which is going to be quite interesting. So yeah, again, very bullish. Um, and I, I continually have chats with a lot of non-coiner friends. And like, there are still people getting that. So the, the issue is, is that there's so, so much of a stigma um, with non-coiners, with, with crypto and, and risk. And a lot of people don't really understand risk. And, you know, you can explain to the cows come home about what's happening with the Argentinian peso. And we're slowly being broiled alive uh, by having this melting ice cube of a currency. Um, it's not enough to really move people. You then look at, you know, how, you know, Bitcoin is, you know, outpacing everything. It's still not enough. People are too comfortable. And even people that have been orange pilled and go, oh, yeah, Bitcoin's amazing. It definitely is a way forward. They'll still only just put their toe in the water and put 10% of the net worth in crypto, which I think is still, you know, foolish. Because um, effectively what they're saying is, you know, if you... Obviously, I'm a little bit extreme with my crypto thoughts, but just, but it's just because I, I view the world in a very alien way compared to most people. But if you're 90%, you know, fiat or fiat denominated assets and 10% crypto, even if it's just Bitcoin, what you're basically saying is that I love fiat so much that, you know, fiat has such, you know, whether it's GBP or USD, it's like it has way more prospects than Bitcoin. It has a better tokenomics, yada, yada, yada. And, you know, I think you're financially reckless if you're doing something like that. You should be the other way around. Um, I'm 99, like 99 percent of my liquid net worth is in crypto. And even then, I still feel underexposed. I've only got 1% of my liquid net worth for boring bills. And even then I'm looking at that chunk of money sat in my bank account going, ah, oh, I could 30x this over two years. <laughs> um, but then again, over the last two cycles, I have overstretched myself. Um, but yeah. And so you, even when you do orange pill someone, they're going to have year, a whole lifetime of trying to shed societal norms um, so yeah so that's that